Hello YouTube and welcome to episodes 1 and 2 in my Koyomi Monogatari reaction series. Back here again today for some more Monogatari goodness. Starting a new entry, new, old entry, was supposed to come before. Anyway, you know what I mean, we're moving on to something else that isn't Awari. So Awari's in the bag, Awari was very good broadly. Um, shoutouts to Monogatari I guess. Yeah, just uh, upon reflection, probably the strongest segment i don't know i don't know i need to think about it again but if we're considering second season as one whole segment it's definitely got highs and lows but it's probably the only one that competes i don't know it d depends on if we're classifying it arc by arc or classifying it as a whole piece of like blank then monogatari i don't know um, I don't know what people normally rank things as, but it was very good is what I wanted to get across. I guess we'll, we'll jump into the YouTube comments from last week and see what you guys had to say. I think there's about 10 here, but some of them tend to be fairly long. Um, first comment here is something that I wanted to talk about as well. G-Bird, book. Yes, yes, indeed, book. Book is sitting over there on my bedside table. I have not read books since I last spoke to you. I've been very busy. I worked basically every day, uh, and I normally read before bed, and I worked late, so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a good excuse, but um, potentially I'll I have a day off today. I'll read some tonight, and I'll get back to you editing-wise. When I edit this, I'll, I'll, I'll put a piece in about the book, potentially even here, but I'll see if I read anything, basically. Like, yeah. More book content is coming, I, I, I swear to God. Hey, hi, it's editing me. Uh, I haven't really gotten that much further as well. Um, I, I got to the part, I'm still in Hitagi Crab, I've gotten to the part where we're out of the Senjogahara house and we're pretty much on our way to um, the cram school with Meme. Chapter 6, I believe I'm about to start Chapter 6, if that's any indicator. Uh, observations, um, I'm, I'm surprised by how much of the story is gotten across in the anime pretty well. Like, I'm not lost at all. Uh, there hasn't really been any tangents like that. The tangents that do happen are generally still jokes. I guess this arc is probably a fair bit shorter than other ones, you would imagine, as well, um, considering it's the first arc of the series and all that stuff. So a lot of what's cut, again, is, is comedy. Um, it's pretty funny. I think they follow a very similar joke structure to a lot of Japanese media, correct me if I'm wrong. There's one that's like... Like, person will say something, person will say something, person will say something, person will say something ridiculous, other person will react. It's a lot of that. It's, a, it's that kind of, like, five-sentence joke structure that you'll see even, they, like, they take line breaks for it. Um, but other than that, yeah, the, the characters are still the characters. There hasn't really been that many little tidbits. I guess, yeah, there's, there's still, like, references to Golden Week and and uh, spring break all over the place. But other than that, it's pretty much same as normal. I'm enjoying myself. It's pretty good. Next comment here by Cochin. For obvious reasons, I can't say much, but this rewatch with you has really solidified in my mind the nuances of why novel order is cool and why democracy is bad. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to guess what this arc entails is, is basically what I'm trying to say. Like it's been very mysterious uh, this whole order discussion and where it should be and why it should be. And then there's a comment later that infers some things about the, I guess, the sign decisions, <laughs> the, the structure of this arc, that it may not be traditional, it may be shorter in length episode-wise, and may jump around on the timeline a lot. Again, with a name like Koyomi Monogatari, you would think it's broadly about Aragi. Um... I, I just, yeah, I wonder how this informs other stuff. You'd have to think it would have something to do with Orgi, have stuff to do with Aragi's past, as revealed in the Sodachi arcs, um, and how it impacts something else we talk about later in the comments as well, how Aragi is feeling by the end of it all. So the latest point on the timeline, well, before we see Araragi and Hanamonogatari, but, but the latest point for Araragi right now is that last conversation with Yotsugi, where he's like, things suck. I'm in a bad way. Um, so, yeah, how, how is everything informing that? Yeah, I'm just trying to piece it all together, and I don't know if I'm being quite successful yet. Next comment here, Trails to the Plus. Uh, after being a little mean to Monogatari last week, I'm happy to say that the conversation between Shinobu and Kambaru at the shrine is still my favourite scene in the whole show. 
uh, and from such an unlikely pairing as well. If you guys need context about this part, we were talking about how the pacing was kind of terrible, because it kind of was. But yeah, as soon as you get out of that and all the setups start to pay off, it's it's really quite good, uh, which is how a lot of television works, actually. But um, it, unlikely pairing is definitely the term I would use. I would not say that these two characters have a lot in common and their conversation's actually poignant and really cool. Um, I, I liked it a lot too. This is probably the most interesting part of it as well. Um, well, Kambaru being unwavering and completely Kambaru in that conversation as well. But this is perhaps what Gaian meant when she said that letting Kambaru's genius go to waste, or, or we were letting Kambaru's genius go to waste. Um, yeah, like, <laughs> again, she knows everything. She knows that Kambaru would have some feelings about this, potentially, like, again, she already knows about the first and that whole situation brewing and all the war and everything. Uh, so getting Kambaru involved is, quite frankly, a stroke of genius. But also you have to see Gainazuko is also Nisio Asin, right? Seeing that connection between what he's got brewing here and what he had brewing in the past and then bringing in the perfect character at the perfect moment to say the perfect thing to make the, the good thing happen. But again, Gainazuko may have some other reason for doing this, involving armor and the forging of some sword, and we're focusing on that name of the of the first a lot. So, again, Gaian good, but also Gaian maybe bad? <laughs> Which has, again, been broadly the, the feeling the entire time. There's some good insight as well. So, Aragi, upon hearing that whole conversation between Shinobu and Kambaru still decides to go ahead with the duel, even though the kind of outcome of that conversation should have been Shinobu taking it into her own hands and finishing it herself. Uh, Araragi is essentially taking Kambaru's advice for Shinobu and applying it to himself, thinking that the best way to resolve things with the first is to resolve things directly. Like she says, like, cut it off. Uh, face your fears, essentially. He's taking that lesson out of it. And in a very similar way to the way Suruga Monkey played out is the way that this plays out with a conflict between the two people that are trying to court the one person, essentially, uh, with the with the third, the, the one they're essentially like honing in on on that triangle, um, coming in and saving the day. I mean, Aragi had kind of already won the fight, though, with the seal which I thought was cool too. Uh, it, yeah, there's there's parallels there is what I'm getting at. Yeah, from that same perspective, Shinobu allowed that duel to play out. From the same perspective, like, Araragi letting them talk it out, Kambaru and Shinobu, earlier, Shinobu lets the, the duel play out between Araragi and the first. Yeah, the upgrading of the sword was weird though. I don't know. Fulfilling the first's wish by returning his sword to him? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe she just wanted Araragi dead secretly. We, we'll never know. Next comment here, Hot Wheels Kid. This book looks sick. I bet it'd look even cooler sitting on your shelf next to Zaregoto version 2, or the, the second entry in the series. Uh, I looked. Believe me, I looked. Um, I looked for a number of things, and in the three different stores that I, that I visited in Melbourne's CBD, I did not find it. Um, that does not mean that I do not want to read it. Uh, I would just need to order it from somewhere, you would think. Um, it, it, and it'll depend on how... This goes with the with the one over there with Baki Monogatari. If I want to continue Monogatari and that takes precedence or or what comes of it, I I don't I don't really know. Again, I would like to reread that first book if I was to reapproach Zaragoto again. Next comment here by Matt. Uh, I really enjoyed these reactions, especially your discussions about all the callbacks to previous arcs. Yeah, the timeline really helped with that kind of stuff. But I'm I'm, I'm glad people appreciate. And th this was what I was talking about before. But like so. So Araragi and Shinobu have reaffirmed lifelong, awesome connection, epic style stuff <laughs> in, in Kabuki. This happens like literally two days after. Uh, but also like like this taking place at the end of March or the middle of March, like 13th or so. Um, it's pretty scary to hear Araragi repeating Sodachi's defeatist lines about the futility of happiness. Big red flag. Maybe, potentially, something that Orgi is trying to do. And succeeding at making Araragi feel bad. <laughs> and he may need something or someone to pull him out of it. So yeah, th this is definitely something I missed last week. I was like, what's all this stuff about happiness? And like, like I forget the specific lines there. 
like happiness sucks broadly. Yeah, that that and I said, hey, this reminds me of a lot of the Sodachi lines. But that was the Sodachi lines from the episode before the resolution episode, the one where she's like explaining how fucked up her situation is. Again, before it gets even more fucked up, but then we're still ending on a on a weirdly hopeful ending. Anyway, yeah, Sodachi Lost is a great arc, but like Araragi's taken the the wrong lesson. He he literally did this like months ago. You know what I mean? And now, after everything, after Augie's been pulling all these strings, getting people away from him, he's reverted back to some kind of futility of happiness ethos. Um, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe a reversion of Araragi back to what he was like even before the series started. Yeah. Lots of, lots of stuff to dig into there. Um, specifically, this portmanteau of... Koyo mist is like like an economist or a chemist. It isn't like the word mist. You know what I mean? It's like expert of. So I'm an expert of Koyomi. Yeah, that being Orgi at this moment in the story. So what does this imply about Orgi going forward? I think she's winning right now. And we, we have enough story left to the point where Arag is going to go down low and then come back up out of it again. Um, you would hope. I, I haven't heard this series has a downer ending, so <laughs> you would imagine that he comes back out of it. Or if, even if he needs to come back out of it, I don't know if he goes on some kind of journey of self-discovery there. Um, and then there's this last uh, part of the comment here, this last paragraph, which probably speaks to more of the future stuff that we're going to watch today. Uh, I describe it the next arc as primer on the concepts and themes of Monogatari, of the Monogatari world, to set the stage for the finale. The finale that's already been going on for a little bit. It's very different narratively from other seasons. Half-length episodes, which is why I'm doing two today, because normally I just do one when I'm starting something new. Um, so I'm doing two, because it'll be one episode's worth of content. They're more slice of life than drama, with a sprinkle of lore, a pinch of nostalgia, and a dash of plot. Uh, have your timeline handy, and remember that Koyomi means calendar, and a thing with 12 episodes slash months. Um, yeah, so, so this, probably, I'm bordering on spoilery, I don't know, um, I'd like to learn this rather than being told this, but now this is also set expectations in a nice way, um, this is where I'll also bring in this part, actually. So I've kind of been lying to you, <laughs> I haven't been lying to you guys, but I, I have some kind of indicator whenever I think an episode or something is going to go in a certain direction. Because I have, like, one frame of, like, stuff to gather from it. So, I remember the specific one was... It was here before I started a Tori. I'm like, well, that's clearly Nadeko. And that's clearly Nadeko. And you can infer that these are Nadeko as well. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is a Nadeko arc. Like, <laughs> like I can gather information. I'm, I'm not stupid, and if I accidentally see things, I accidentally see things. Bringing me back to here. Well... I'm pretty sure that's from the first Baki Monogatari opening, right? And I'm pretty sure that that's from uh, Mayui Snail. And I'm pretty sure that that's just Renai Circulation. And then these may be other openings as well. I think I recognize this. Um, inferring that, hey, each of these are going to take place in, in certain parts of the story and we're going to jump around a lot. Hence why I have to keep my timeline handy. Um, so yeah, looking forward to hearing all these openings again. That'll be awesome. But um, but yeah, I've got that piece of knowledge, and I just want to make sure that people know. Next comment here by J Putt or J J Putt. I'm gonna say J Putt. Uh, another great connection to the other arc is that Araragi finally gives a concrete answer to Hanakawa's confession immediately after hearing Kambara's lecture and seeing Shinobu confront the first. Um, yeah, this is a great point. I, actually, no, I'll finish first. I love the ending to, of Neko Shiro. Araragi laying it all out and properly rejecting her was such a great character progression and so satisfying after seeing him stuck in a cowardly avoidance pattern for so long, and now we finally get to see what prompted it, that growth. Essentially, what this person said. Um, I, I, This is a connection that I probably should have made, and probably a connection that's a lot easier to make if you watched it in some kind of chronological order, but that, again, not feasible. Um, seeing Araragi take lessons immediately from what he's just done and then go and save, save, uh, Hanakawa and give her an actual answer, cut things off, crush it rather than let it fade away, which I think was the term from that episode. 
approach your problems head on. Yeah, try not to let them linger if if we want to say that. Um, yeah, th this was great, and a great observation that I missed last episode. MC Steve, with a longer comment here today, uh, going into a lot of different things, starting with the names. Uh, names in Monogatari have relevant meaning, uh, the name of the first being Seishiro uh, Shishirui. Shishirui? We're going to say Shishirui. So this part of the name uh, refers to the Buddhist concept of cycle of life and death. Again, very relevant, we can see that. The Ro part is typical for more traditional names, uh, potentially alluding to the time period in which he's from. I don't know if it's to imply the idea of uh, Haikome, which is the traditional convention of naming your sons based on birth order. So Shi being the fourth number, fourth son, fourth child. Does he have siblings? Who knows? Either way, it's not odd to see that he's old. In another sense, it also refers to the man or husband of the family. A lot a lot you could go off for that as well. Shishirui is one off the phase Shishirui. Rui. Shishirui? Rui? It's a bit of a tongue twister, which quite literally means heaps of corpses. This apparently is to convey a circumstance which is horrific or and gruesome. So let's put it all together. Life cycle of life and death, um, uh, uh, man of husband house, potentially fourth child, we don't know, and heap of corpses. This is giving me life rebirth, life rebirth, life rebirth a lot, which is, again, what happens to the character in the story. This part here is about... Uh, Guy Nezuko saying something that she shouldn't know again. Uh, there's a part in the start of Shiro where they receive the typoed text where Senju Gahara literally says that Araragi only sees what's right in front of him. And then Guy Nezuko says, wow, Araragi, you really only see what's right in front of you as he goes to save uh, Shinobu over addressing Hanakawa Senju Gahara situation. It's her being a troll, again, is is broadly what the, the point of that is. Yeah, Sen Senju Gahara as a whole, I'm... I'm She's hardly in the show, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, and I know Senju Gahara is very, very popular as a character. I, I knew this before even watching Monogatari. I'm like, I know, I know of Senju Gahara broadly. I know that people like Senju Gahara. Um, and I'm not saying I didn't see it yet, because she's definitely got a lot to offer, and that scene during the last video was great, um, where she was talking to Araragi about some stuff and shedding some light on that particular situation. I thought that was a great piece of writing. Um, I'm just waiting to see her pop-off moment a little bit more, I guess. She has had them, but more of them would be nice. I don't know. I'm still like Team Hanakawa, <laughs> like all the way. Um, I, Yeah, so if there's more to be seen here or potentially it gets alluded to later that it's been happening behind the scenes the whole time, then that's great. That's only what I want from Senju Kahara going forward. This part of the story is broadly talking to maybe learning from Spring Break and old Araraki lessons. Again, he likes to save everybody. He likes to be unhumanly selfless. Uh, and this is him kind of learning that saving everyone is not an option in this particular point in the story, and then he may need to pick and choose, and then he may need to put some trust in other people as a result, and hey, it paid off dividends, Hanakawa repaid that trust, um, which is some cool storytelling. Oh yeah, the whole um, origami thing, right? And we see origami then come through with that, like through the rest of the show in various spots. I remember there was some in Suki Monogatari from the origami guy as well, but that's a whole different thing. It can be implied that Araragi thought it was cute and then just, like, brought it home and they become part of, like, the feng shui of the room, I guess. Um, yeah, that, that's cute. Uh, Re-establishing, or further establishing that connection between Araragi and Senju Kahara. And this, this here is going completely over my head, so I don't... <laughs> I don't understand. Something about Augie meaning fan and then that war and Senju... something. I don't... Yeah, I don't really get it. Sure. Even this part of the comment here saying, hey, I'm shortening up paraphrasing, but you get the gist. Um, there's no footnotes, officially translated in novels, instead just kind of go with whatever. Um, but they do an amazing job of like telling the direction of what we have going on, specifically shouting out Co Ransom, who does most of the series. So... Yeah, he, he he does. He's on he's on the cover of my novel. Another longer comment here from John Bueno. Uh, we reached the end of another season of Monogatari, and there's a lot of novel stuff to share. This is talking to something which I thought was broadly unexplained in the rest of it. So what was the deal with the, the monkey, crab, snake, oddity, chimeric thing that showed up? Uh, so, 
the way he talks and dresses the first, he's meant to have been influenced by the location of the shrine and the town as a result, uh, through his redevelopment, I guess. That's why he wears these clothes, that's why he, even potentially talking to him, dressing like Kaiki, considering Kaiki's been around town as of late. So yeah, he's literally been feeding on these aberrations, that's why when he exploded it, like all the aberration stuff goes everywhere, all the aberration goo, and also explains why he was the one that sent this chimeric oddity, because again, he's he's been feeding on all these aberrations, he can just send a few away to do a job, I guess. Potentially a way of assessing Araragi's abilities, uh, even killing him if he were weak enough to be killed by something like that. And the holy water drink being kind of a loophole, the first explains to us that the mark prevented him from attacking Araragi, but he chose to kill himself from being purified, if he drunk that holy water water, uh, then that's all good. It's a bit of a loophole, and he was being a little bit of a scumbag, wanting to kill Araragi. That's that's no good. Adding some more context about Gaian and the kind of duel that the first demands and the, the, the stick she puts in place, the fake sword. Um, it, the first is really strong. He has all the experience and ability of a specialist, like Kaganui or Meme, plus vampiric power, that of Araragi, if not greater, plus samurai combat prowess, and he, he seems like a bad dude. He's wearing armor, he seems scary. So yeah, this, this would be hard to deal with um, the, the first then a head-on fight. So say he kills Araragi, then goes on a rampage, and potentially could even kill Guy and Izuko. Um, that's why Guy and hired episode to help. Um, the anime didn't say much about his reasons for being there, but in the books, Guy and explains that she got episode there as a failsafe in case Araragi loses the duel and the first fails to comply with the terms of the loss and just goes on and kills everybody. Uh, there's also the other thing of episode being there for some other reasons, potentially, as Augie implies. We go into this now as well. There's some specific allusions between Shinobu's final words to Seishiro and Araragi's words to Hanakawa to kind of end, not end their really like, make clear their relationship. I'd, I'd have to go back and check, like, specific dialogue parallels, but essentially in the, in both cases, uh, they're saying how much they appreciate, how much the other feels for them, uh, but there's somebody else now um, that they want to be with, um, and breaking it off, basically, like, and again, you can, Shinobu says this to Seishiro to be with Araragi, and then Araragi says this to Hanakawa to be with Senjogahara. Again, connecting Shinobu and Senjogahara as their spots in the story. You know what I mean, broadly. Like, there's, there's some stuff going on there, I think. We go into a little bit more Gaian stuff here. So why did she ask for Kambaru's help? So I, I like this part. Um, Gaian didn't need Kambaru's arm. She needed her to lend a hand. So she knows that... Kambaru has this personality, and she's been in this kind of position before, the same as the first, so she would be able to provide some clarity there to a shinobu, potentially. Again, Gain's seen the story already, basically. And then this is weird. So, <laughs> there's a bit of a... I don't know, like a... like a Shaft does this sometimes. They just adapt stuff weird. Um, Gain seems genuinely surprised in the anime when Araraki uses the talisman, but... In the novel, that's not true at all. She's just her usual smug self. Araragi thinks to himself that she is lying again and is not surprised in the least. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's comparable to that one part in Goblet of Fire where the translation didn't quite make it to the to the end product to the ad adaptation, I guess. Um, yeah, interesting one. I mm. so again, Guy and Azuko on top. She knows everything. We we know that. Similar to when uh, Guy and manipulated. Kaiki in Kui Monogatari, giving him money to conclude the job of exercising the Deco, uh, Gaian is extremely calculating and manipulative. She maintains a facade, but things usually play out how she planned them. I said earlier she told Araragi she hired Episode so he could help them yeah, fight the first, but that's not the whole truth. We got that armor thing. Episode kind of disappeared after the duel. Maybe job done, secured armor. Time for Koyomi Monogatari as we approach the end. Yeah, this this is this is some spooky stuff. I'm not sure what Gainazuka is planning, but if she's planning it, it normally comes to fruition. So one to watch there. Next comment here, Clay Proof. 
Uh, I think much like Gainazuko, Kambari may have some semi-supernatural connection slash knowledge of the emotional or logical, or at least the beginning of such a power that could be developed, as there seems to be something old about the Gain bloodline when it comes to the specialist trade. Kaiki said in Nisei that there was a hint of power, but it wasn't enough to worry about, or something in that vein when we first met him. So yeah, this may be some justification for why Kambara was perfect for explaining this situation with Shinobu. Um, potentially it's in her blood. Um, potentially Gainazuka knows that. I, d- I don't know. Unless this is extrapolated upon more, I don't I don't see it. But but sure, let's say it. Let's say that Kambaru has some kind of special lineage bloodline stuff. Because again, there's some there's still some mystery surrounding her mother, broadly, I think. Um or maybe a lot of that was cleared up with the Kaiki connection to the mother. Like he was in love with with with, with her from memory. Wasn't that in what was that in? Is that in Hanamonogatri? I forget. Last comment here, Dharma Mansia. Nisu Asin really knows how to end an arc. The Kambaru Shinobu conversation is what sold me on this arc. She's just spitting facts and knows how it feels being the first and ending up the second. Uh literally like Suruga monkey connections, right? Uh, I also love that Araragi spent some time uh, to call Senjo. We need more Senjo Gahara, I agree, uh, and Araragi romance moments. Uh, for the last part, Orgi is sus and Gain is cooking something. You could say this in perpetuity since they've arrived in the show. Both of them are cooking something good in the background. We'll just have to wait for it to come together. Uh, from the implications of this arc, I would imagine it's not now. I would imagine it's in Awari 2 and Zoku Awari. That's what I would think. But yeah, he does know how to end an arc in a thought-provoking way that gets re-explained to me by the YouTube comments in a lot of ways that I normally miss. So so shout-outs to that. So yeah, this is where I would normally go through my recap and what happened last week, but I don't think it's particularly relevant as we're moving on. I guess some broad conversations about Koyomi Monogatari and what it may mean. Again, Koyomi is... This bloke, <laughs> Araragi, if you guys didn't know by this point. Um, so I'm thinking it's going to be broad vignettes at different points of the story about various things that may impact that with some tidbits here and there that may recontextualize some things. Uh, Discussion-wise, um, I'm probably going to use the timeline a lot, but I don't know if I'm going to talk about the episodes themselves a lot and structure and that kind of thing. I guess I'll see what I can see. Um, and obviously the conversations for a 12-minute episode aren't going to be the same as a 24-minute episode, so they may be on the shorter side. I think I'm almost inferring that some of these episodes may just be one conversation. We, we will see. So if we're taking this month idea, and I, I've seen the thumbnails, and the second thing seems to be Bakemonogatari, and maybe in order, the first thing in the Monogatari timeline that has Aragi on it, kind of, is Kizu. We're going to get some Kizu content. That would be kind of insane. It could be Kizu content. It could be Golden Week content as well, now that I think about it. I don't know. I'll have my timeline ready. Either way, my sure stuff. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation. Comment below. I'm um, doing follow for follow on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter if you'd like me to follow you back. And the Discord. Join Discord. Love Discord. Discord, Discord, Discord. And jumping into episode one of Koyomi Monogatari right now. Oh my god, ladies and gentlemen, we have a disaster on our hands. Uh, I don't have Call Girl subs for these. I don't know if they exist. I don't know what the go is. Uh, I've got Kami. I've got to- Toish. Why? Toishi? And Sajamba. Sajamba. Or I can, you know, try to understand it in Portuguese or Spanish, but I think I'll stick to English. I'm just going to go Kami for this week's two, but please let me know if there's a preference here for subs for this particular portion. may have to re-download some stuff. I don't know. We will see. Either way, I've got this first episode up here ready to go. Um, 13 minutes and 44 seconds on this one, so sync up accordingly. Uh, as always, picture in picture provided in the description below, and I'm using the Kami subs for now. So yeah, just going to give it a 3, 2, 1. Radio, 3, 2, 1, go. Yeah, this is um, Golden Week. This is Neko Kuro. Great. Are we going to get openings and endings as well? That makes the episode even shorter. Little Koyomi Monogatari there as well. 
this would be a good opportunity to like re-review all the openings as well. Oh, Hanukkah with that haircut too. And the glasses, right? Koyomi Stone? I think you could infer that that's the name of the arc. Stone. Like a rock. The rock? I forget, we went through all this opening stuff. These are like charms or bookmarks or something. <laughs> Oh, my audio is a little bit crunchy here, too. I wonder if that'll come through. Yeah, this shows how observ observant I am, because I'm, like, forgetting everything that I used to say about this opening. I like this part, though. I, I understand that a little bit more now. Overwhelming selflessness. The need to save another... Calendar story. Okay, that would be your Koyomi connection. Aprilis? April 11th. Okay. A stone. What are you guys talking about, man? This is like... <laughs> what I just read in my book. A story about a stone statue. Yeah, aberration-y stuff. Seven Wonders of the School. I agree. <laughs> okay. Ghost story. We're going through chapters very quickly. It looks like a stone to me. He did. Did something ghostly happen? Please explain. Well, he would be interested if it was genuinely ghostly. Well, it looks like a newer building. Well, there was a classroom that, um, that appeared out of nowhere before. Well, not before. You know what I mean. That I have seen before. So the stone maybe got switched out. I don't know, she was observant. Not like you. Interesting shot. It's a very Hanakawa thing to say. But what about the house? The house around it. I see. What are the offerings? They look like a candy bar. Okay, who's researching or worshipping this stone? Oshino Meme on screen, please. Please clap when you see him on screen. Oh, it's him. He's back, kind of. Okay. Well, it's all about human belief. We've talked about that a lot. Yeah. I would think it would be the latter.
Yeah, I, I understood that. You can create aberrations based on belief and circumstance. We, we've seen this. Hello, Shinobu, by the way. A picture of the stone. Get Nadeko in, she can do some manga art. Hmm. Clumsily imitating something. Yeah, I mean, it gave me that kind of vibe. Oh no, is it shoddy because it was made in like a high school woodworking class? Okay, bit of a visual learner. <laughs> I don't. I am confused. We've been talking for like th three straight minutes and now you said that? Try looking into the curriculum? Okay. <laughs> yeah, do you understand? Okay. Well, woodworking would make sense, right? Oh, so there may be a certain class that may be responsible? Bro, I accidentally came up with the right answer by joke. I'm amazing. Oh, I say love this song, by the way. This is one of my favorite Monogatari songs. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, I did notice that before as well. The pink dumpsters. Huh. But who, like, put the offerings out for it? Okay. Another interesting shot. Okay, we solved a mystery. Again, massive, like, Hyoka vibes off this, yeah? Yeah, I was going to say, so what's the connection?
Did you potentially forget that you did this? This seems like something Araragi would do. <laughs> That's another great callback to um to Bake, right? Why? Yeah. Okay. And then you forgot. Arug is very good at forgetting stuff. Yeah, they probably apply to more concepts than just this. Cheap sweets? Well, that implies to a lot of the rest of the show. Oh yeah, and then, okay. Hmm. Interesting, because now we know about Araragi's, like, he attracts aberrations as well. What? <laughs> what does that mean? Is this a unique little ED? This is whimsical. Listen to this. Hello. I didn't expect this vibe at all. How lovely. I kick a stone to get away, get rid of my worries. Is this ED unique to this episode? Because that's insane. I love it, by the way. All of your favorites are here. They're totally not dead, or they haven't run away yet, or, or nothing. They're all here. So I mean, evidently, I'll I'll read lyrics on this and do analysis here, but probably not in the opening that I've seen already, because I think that's more just denoting time in the story that it's happening rather than actual implications. Because I don't think any of that Hanakawa BS had to do with the stone. Oh my god, Aragi's dead again. Yeah, a little bit of analysis on a strange old episode, uh, episode one of. Koyomi Monogatari. And we are back after, yeah, a very interesting episode one. Um, so first thing I did, I went to my timeline and had a little bit of a look. I'm like, okay, well, this is post-spring break by not long, really. Again, I th I'm from memory, I just looked up when spring break was in Japan, and that was the time period. So let's say it was like two weeks after or something like that, right? The other thing being that this takes place, you know, in the middle of spring break, and Golden Week. So what happens in Golden Week is the Neko Kuro stuff starts, like the the Black Hanakawa, that whole thing. Sawari Neko. That whole thing starts to occur. So <laughs> I've I've got something in my head that's broadly this is metaphorical about a lot of things in the show. That Araragi doing some stuff without thinking and or forgetting and that that kind of thing. It's broadly led to aberrations occurring. Him not him averting his eyes, him looking away from certain stuff, has led to aberrations forming, metaphorically. That's what I'm getting out of this, as well as it just being like a cute hyoka esque escapade about finding out a small mystery about the school. Um, yeah, I'm, it feels just like Hyoka, like <laughs> probably less involved, but essentially, hey, we're, we're going to try to find out a mystery, especially those early episodes where it's like, the mystery is kind of lame, but it tells you more about the characters themselves than, than anything else and what they're all about. Watch Yorka, by the way. It's really good. And that, you know, this is like the start. Are we going to keep following the stone? 
it was called Koyumi Stone. Oh, is everything going to be at the stone? Is the it's a piece of concrete? I I don't know. It's hard. Um. Either way, I, I guess I'll just recap, which you know is probably more involved than it needs to be. But it's about Hanakawa, her curiosity with a small stone statue. Aragi and Hanakawa go out to have a look, see a small, shoddily built house with a smooth stone inside and something of an offering made to it. Hanakawa suggests that it may be some kind of oddity thing and thinks that Oshino Meme may be interested. Oshino seems amused by the situation and asks Aragi a number of questions about if it's an oddity because it's worshipped or worshipped because it's an oddity. He ends by telling Hanakawa and Araragi to look at the school curriculum. This is where I'll kind of explain what happened. So Araragi picked woodwork over fine arts because he's a boy and boys do woodwork and they have to do woodwork because I ended up doing woodwork at one point or another and I'm probably the least handy person on the planet. Araragi then remembers that, hey, it, it was me. I was the one that built this. It was near the dumpster, but I didn't want to go to the dumpster, so I just kind of chucked it in the garden and... I don't remember if he put the stone in there or somebody else put the stone in there, but now it's spiraled off to this whole aberration adjacent thing, or because of something that he averted his eyes from, didn't do his duty correctly. Again, this lesson may spread on to other stuff. Most notably, I'm thinking Black Hanakawa, right? I ignored the Hanakawa thing for too long. I ignored all the signs about Hanakawa and her personal situation for too long, especially about you know, my family being cops and that kind of thing. And then we're bringing in a lot of that Sodachi stuff. Potentially I've averted my eyes from that too long and it's it's turned into an aberration. That's what I'm seeing out of it anyway. It also adds to a little bit of stuff from, again, those Sodachi arcs of Araragi being broadly forgetful about certain things. Um, like not thinking anything of this or thinking that putting this in the garden is particularly... Like, not a good thing to do, so I'm just going to forget about it. Um, does not want to remember it, does not deem it as necessary to remember even. Um, and because of that, gets his just desserts. Um, it's a feel-bad memory for him, potentially. Potentially, Augie could tell him about this house and his whole fucking worldview comes crumbling down. Potentially not. But, um, yeah, I, I think this is more interesting when you think about it in context with everything else, up to and including Neko Kuro, as well as all the Augie arcs from the start of Owari. Yeah, and I think I'm going to keep this system in my timeline going, just because I'm imagining we're going to be moving around a lot. Just put it in purple if it's in Koyomi Monogatari. Um, that way it separates itself out from everything else. I know that it's information after the fact, and it can stay that way. Also, purple's a cool color, so we're going to keep it there anyway. So now in saying all of that, I don't know how much of this I'm actually going to look into, right? I've basically told you everything. A lot of it's just dialogue explaining what I just said. I guess another thing relating it to the events of Neko Kuro would be the opening <laughs> that is on screen right now. This is the Neko Kuro opening. Um, I remember liking it and I still kind of like it. It's not my favorite, but I still like it. And yeah, it may give credence to my little theory there before about what the stone and the statue in the house actually means. Like, like I've created the structure for this, I abandoned it, and then was surprised when it turned into an oddity. There's also the whole thing about Araragi being an oddity vampire person himself and attracting more oddities to whatever he does. Yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. Either way, I don't think I'll relook at the opening too hard. Uh, calendar story. So ko Koyomi meaning calendar. This is calendar story, whilst also being stories about Araragi. That's that's the thing. Koyomi stone. I wonder if this stone is going to stick around and be the central conceit of a lot of what we have going on? Question uh, mark. A really weird thing happens at the start of the episode. Let me look at this. Chapter one. Aprilis. A Aprilis? Cut three, which is what they've been doing in a lot of stuff throughout the whole series. This is the third cut of the episode. It just says A Aprilis. And then chapter two, I do not understand. Uh, I do not know how the novel is structured for why you would want to do this, <laughs> but it's freaking me out. I, I don't really get it. So we start talking about this stone statue. We're in a very familiar classroom setting. These two people are class president, vice class president. That's why they're doing this. They're probably planning something, just hanging out late after school um, in a totally not romantic way, according to Araragi, because he's fucking stupid. 
Um, but we've been through that. Uh, and we're talking about the stone statue. But it's not exactly a stone statue. It's a stone posing as a statue. Oshino may want to look into this because he collects stories on such things. We get a lot of classic framing here. It's a little bit of nostalgia, uh, as one of the commenters mentioned, um, going through various points of the story and probably using similar shots to invoke that sense of nostalgia. Um, I like it. It's bringing me back to, again, Neko Kuro, but also like the start of Bake. So there's that kind of meta layer to this portion of the story as well, that we are going back to stuff the audience has seen as well and using similar techniques from those particular arcs. So this school is particularly young. It may not have a seven, seven wonders of the school, some mysteries that we can look into. Um, I believe that that's a thing in a, in a ton of different manga I've read, like mysteries around the school, that kind of thing. I'm think, I don't know why it makes me think of uh, Hanako-kun. I don't know why, but it does. So we go out to investigate this ghost story about the stone, and we see this. Look, it's, it's a shoddily built, shrine to a very smooth piece of concrete uh which has an offering of like a candy bar and like something else down the bottom looks very pretty and it kind of just stuck around oshino helped us a lot over spring break i figured we could tell him if something ghostly happened at our school because he likes these kind of things but up here we also see these dumpsters which have uh, like a very different color from the rest of everything else like it's stuck in my mind without me really noticing it i think it's a great visual touch so this is the only thing that we can even call a ghost story at this school. So we have to provide him with, with something because we're trying to repay him for all of the spring break stuff. Which, if you didn't know, that's Kizu. That's Kizu Monogatari. That's all that business. So Hanakawa probed. Interesting shot again. Uh, Hanakawa probed around the school to find anything. Um, this is the only thing that she could find <laughs> that was remotely interesting about the school. And, and Hanakawa remembers that the stone was there. But the little house wasn't there uh, like when she first came to school and started looking around. It used to look different. The stone was here, but the shrine wasn't. <gasps> so somebody's built a shrine to this stone. The platform wasn't here, neither were the offerings. In the two intervening years, someone propped the stone up like a statue and began to worship it. Or began to worship it. However, we're doing a, you know chicken egg type situation what was first was the shrine here first and then the stone moved in or was the shrine built because the stone existed so with that information in mind we go off to Oshino Meme and it's just great to see him again we haven't seen Oshino Meme dialogue wise since Kabuki yeah I think so when we're time traveling I think that's the last time we've seen him. Another interesting thing here is we see Shinobu in the corner over here. Uh, Shinobu's not wearing her little helmet. So if we're timelining it out, uh, Baki Monogatari, which is May 8th, it starts on May 8th, between April 11th and May 8th, she got sick of his shit even more and put on a helmet to prevent head pats. <laughs> which is interesting I, I think that's the implication about the helmet anyway i don't remember her wearing the helmet in neko kuro actually as well so that must be a new thing when we walk in in, in bake first line by oshino meme it's hard to call this a story about oddities but it is interesting yeah it is it's interesting for araragi personally as well as it metaphorically if not actual tangible oddity aberration -y stuff happening. And yeah, like, Meme gets it immediately and is just being coy. He's uh, playing with Araragi a little bit. Is it being worshipped because it's an oddity? Or did it become an oddity from the worship? The worship, of course, being the, the, the building, the shrine itself. But he re-clarifies here. The question is whether it's being worshipped because it's an oddity, or whether it became an oddity because it was being worshipped. There's a bit of tense there, is what we're trying to get across in, in the kind of denotion there. Um, and again, it makes sense by the end of the arc. Um, but yeah, the shrine was built, and then thing happened. So then we get Araragi to draw a picture of it. So the shrine looks like this. The shrine itself looked like it was clumsily imitating something. And Araragi has some vague memories of it, like I saw something at a temple somewhere, or a wayside statue, or something like that. I feel like I've seen it shape before. It's because you built it, big dog. And again, this is when, like, Oshino's really struggling here. Like, like you should have told me this way earlier. Did you save it up last to trump up your erudition? Which, yeah, sure, you're being smart. I like Shinobu in the back, just like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna lie on the ground. Oh my god, did Araragi say I didn't really remember anything concrete just then? Yeah, I don't really remember anything concrete. You serious? 
Is this actually a pun? But yeah, he, he feels like he's seen this stone before and uses, I think, a number of famous art pieces to like invoke that same memory. So that, yeah, I, I don't know when specifically Oshino figures it all out, but now he just like puts on a face, right? You look him lively, he says he's catchphrase rather than explaining it. Tell Miss Class Rep, Hanakawa, tell her this. Um, ignore these ghost stories for the moment. Try looking into Naoetsu High School's curriculum, and this will give us a clue as to what actually happened. And again, Hanakawa, smart. She, she's very smart. She figures it out basically immediately after hearing, hey, I should look into the curriculum. And uh, like, Aragi's super confused, right? Please explain it to me. I like, I don't get it. So the curriculum at the school, first year, you get to pick between fine arts, calligraphy, or woodworking. So when Oshino said curriculum, he was suggesting looking into woodworking. If I remember correctly, the, the people of woodworking had to make a small house of wood, which may be the house that houses and shrines the stone. <gasps> so now Hanakawa thinks that it was a failed attempt to make one of those houses. So he made a little shit house in woodworking. Again, I'm pretty sure that this is that similar art reference again. And since he would only throw it out when he went home, who does this silhouette look like as well? Um, since he would only throw it out when he went home, he decided to just throw it out at the school. I have definitely been in this situation as well. And yeah, early in high school, I did like woodworking, metalworking, all that stuff. They like kind of make you do it. It's part of the curriculum. Just give you a taste of everything before you choose your electives, that kind of thing. And yeah, I definitely built some absolutely shoddy garbage that is now in the trash. So he walks to the trash. The trash is up there, but the garden bed's there. He looks at it, figures, well, this wouldn't look so bad with the stone inside. And there's then my little confirmation that Araragi was, yes, the one that housed the stone in there as well. It isn't the stone looking like a statue because it's, you know, enshrined. It's because the, like, the, the stone makes the piece of junk look like a shrine. Like, that's the, that's the, like, chicken egg stuff we have going on. And yes, this little failure, this little thing that Aragi had ignored, had put to the wayside, had transformed the next time that he looked. Again, probably denoting some Neko Kuro connection. And now I can relax, says Hanakawa. Thanks, Aragi. Well, I think, yeah, this is indicative of future stuff that's happening to you. And then, yeah, like, Hanakawa figures it all out. Hey, you probably did woodworking as well. That's when... Meme probably figured it out when you showed him the thing and then said you thought the stone was familiar. That's when he figured it all out. Because Aragi's a boy and boys do woodworking and they don't get to do fine arts. It's, it's the rules. On oh, the fine arts is probably what all the art pieces are about as well in the story. Interesting. As like Hanakawa is explaining it, we get lots of different references to pieces of art. Interesting. Aragi immediately gets up and sprints to the little shrine. We get a little cute Hanakawa don't run in the hallway. Here's the epilogue. I'm going to destroy the shrine. So obviously it was I who made this shrine ages ago during my first year. I put it down there, did the thing, ignored it. When I looked at it again after forgetting it, I had to ask Oshino and do all that stuff, but it, it had transformed into something else. The during the first year part's very interesting for uh, references back to the classroom from Augie Formula. Yeah, where, the classroom during his first year of high school where there's the whole conflict about the test results. You know what I'm talking about, right? That whole classroom thing. So yeah, potentially referential to that, him forgetting something from his first year that spiraled off into something else. Yeah, here's where we get to the more interesting stuff. My thoughtless actions potentially turned this stone into an oddity. It turned from a normal stone into a stone statue I needed. And from there, an abnormal oddity. Uh, even here we see his little shadow is the dude in the, in the hat from the little part we saw before when Hanukkah was explaining things, which is cute too. How like my actions in the past reflected my actions in the future. Pretty cool. Because of such a thing, going to school with no particular goal in mind, of accomplishing tasks with no particular thought, of maybe potentially averting one's eyes, can result in dire consequences. I went back to class and asked Kanakawa whether being unable to appreciate normal normality, normality meant that I was like stones and wood. However, this stone is just concrete, so my little wordplay metaphor thing didn't really make much sense. Um, which also harkens back to something about concrete from the conversation with Oshino that I made earlier. Anyway, e e ED time. So this song is a completely different vibe. It's hugely slice of life. It's poppy. It's fresh. It feels like I'm frolicking through a garden of flowers, among other things. Uh, still using that ED art style, of course. Um, and yeah, I, I like this a lot. I hope this sticks around, but the lyrics seem to denote that it was only really for 
this arc or, or this particular episode of this arc. So unless the stone keeps coming back. But yeah, I kind of get why you would watch this even now before the Augie stuff. Because him forgetting stuff and, you know, averting eyes and blah, 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 blah. And things, him, him ignoring certain things, turning into oddities and doing that kind of thing is, yeah, thematically relevant for a lot of that kind of stuff. Even thematically relevant up to and including, like, uh, Shinobu Mail, who that was about forgetting certain things or, or averting eyes or not saying information correctly and that spawning off into more and more problems. I don't know. I kick a stone away to get rid of my worries. I'm downplaying the flutter, the flutter I feel this April. Now, this is the line that indicates to me that maybe this is only for this episode. We have various characters in the Monogatari extended universe all singing to Aragi, eventually overwhelming him, using this, like, very summery palette as well. What what time of year is, is that in Japan? It would be spring. Yeah, spring, flowers. Okay, I understand. We were happy children, full of curiosity. I was the one who pushed you forward. That's like almost like Hanakawa singing there too. Let's escape our confines and stop on the way. Let's ride our bikes too far away. Um, and yeah, oh, Trisail. I know Trisail. Trisail make good music, everybody. Um, they've also worked with um, with Shaft a number of times before. Let's ride our bikes too far away, carrying our hopes and dreams in the basket. Yeah, various characters even like up to and including these newish characters too that wouldn't have existed back then um yeah everybody's here they're all here it's like smash brothers everybody is here the future we talked about looks nice the shadows grow longer and we are none the wiser and yeah araki dies he's dead again um lyrically i didn't really understand that at all um it seems very broad um, and could apply to a lot of different characters. There's there's not really a POV character here. Um, and the, it's it's sung by an external group. It's not a character singing it. So, oh. <laughs> I, I don't know what to make of the UD. It's very it's very cheerful, and I like seeing all the characters. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it was good, though, but I don't know what to make of it. So, I mean, are all of these going to be like that? I don't know. We're going to see. Uh, I'm going to jump into the next one now. Radio got the next one up here ready to go. Koyomi Monogatari episode 2. Uh, 13 and 44 again. 30 minutes, 44 seconds. I believe that was the same as last time. Still using those commie subs. Picture and picture in the description below. I'm just going to give it a 3, 2, 1. Radio. 3, 2, 1. Go. Yeah, I was about to say I would, I would expect staple opening to play this slaps by the way this opening <laughs> yeah this one's fucking good again definitely expect an uh, an openings ranking an ed ranking that kind of video i was i was thinking of ways to do it as well um like Maybe I do some kind of video that could only be viewed off of YouTube where I watch through them all again and then rank them piece by piece and then only put up like a little bit more of a summary thing. Like put like deliberations up as a separate video off of YouTube and put, um, oh my God, and put the actual like ranking itself on YouTube and explain it there. I don't know. This is very nostalgic, though. I haven't heard this in ages. Again, we only really see this opening for not very long as well. From memory, it's a two-episode arc. Hello, Giant Senjugahara. We love Giant Senjugahara. Get it? Wait. Do you get it? I get it. Heavy feelings of mine. They certainly were heavy feelings. Like, the, the thing that happened to you sucked. It sucked bad. Koyomi Flower? Okay, I guess we're getting away from the stone. Mouse? May 9th. Okay, slightly after Bake. Or the first part of Bake. Oh, this song too? Oh my god, I haven't heard this in ages. Okay, so this is the day after that. Yep, 
Yeah, I mean, you were light for so long that having that amount of weight back would be pretty cool. I mean, not the whole emotional side of it, not notwithstanding. Yeah, don't worry about those fees. What? Oh, another ghost story. Oh yeah, because we pay Oshino back in ghost stories, right? Interesting. Okay. But what about this flower? <laughs> okay, that's cute. Yeah, we're not there yet. Wait until after my use snail, she may be more receptive. There was a pedestrian crossing, I thought. Yeah, that flower. Or those, that set of flowers. Okay, that's more interesting. I'm recording. Little Araragi. Oh, okay. Omoi? <gasps> okay. Oh, fan. We, we were talking about that in the comments. What are we doing? <laughs> Why is he free climbing? On a different day? Okay. Okay, building of schools never good. That always implies like suicide stuff. Fresh. Whenever I see a flower, I just always want to say it's lilies. Yeah. Personal security? Yeah. I, I She had a bunch of stationery, I remember. She needed to be so people didn't find out about her, and then she just slipped on a banana peel. Okay. Please explain. So why are there flowers up here? I love the uh, the clouds there, very cool. Oh, we go to Oshino again. Is it worth a uh, hundred thousand yen? Denwabango, huh? <gasps> Helmeted. No way. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> it did seem like a weird turn. Okay. Yeah, that would be the mystery. Oh well, yeah, it's more dangerous than just standing on land. Especially in schools, that's a liability nightmare. 
<laughs> Attack on Titan reference, everybody. Opposites of places of power. What? Okay. Yeah, that's what I would have thought too. Yeah, because of some structural issue. Yeah. Okay, then that's clearly indicative of future stuff. Oh, and then this same line again. Huh. Okay, so at the end of May you told her about it. Rooftop management? I agree. Tasteless subterfuge. Oh. Yeah, but in the process of that, does it make it more dangerous? Much like the intersection. That's a... Th this is terrible. <laughs> oh. Okay, so it wasn't like an official thing. It was just like a spur of the moment. So just on the off chance. Okay, you guys are definitely in a different spot than when we first had the conversation as well. Like a serpent, snake, snake reference. I don't know, he's insane. He's a specialist. He's good at this kind of thing. Oh. Really? Mistake made. Okay. <laughs> Would you know anything about that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, isn't that, isn't that just great? Mm, it's our cross to bear. What do you mean? Oh, 
Okay. Uh, and then that's about a worry. And maybe even future stuff from there. What we've done up till now, forget about it. But why would you say that? And we're still keeping the CD. That's great. Okay, good. Um, I'll need to have another look at that line by Oshino. Because that last line of the episode was very indicative of stuff as well. Like forgetting stuff that informs a worry. Yeah, I, I see the way that I'm just kind of retroactively like filling in the gaps after already knowing what happens. I guess I'd be really lost at this point without that. But then it would become clear later on. I'd be like, oh, like Koyomi Monogatari, that's what I would do. Interesting. Okay. Who was that character with the... It was a character I didn't think I recognized there. Had like a ponytail. Yeah. I was going to grab the mouse like you guys could see. You can't. And yeah, moving on to analysis on episode two of Koyomi Monogatari. So we're back. Um, I've written a small piece here. I mean, I say small, but they end up longer each and every time I try to write one. Uh, it's mostly because we're telling like a full arc of a small story in an episode. So writing a recap involves a lot of stuff. <laughs> like like set up, conflict, solution. Like that, that kind of broad structure to the episodes. Speaking of other broad structural things, we're involving Oshino again. Uh, there's a part where he literally just calls it the epilogue slash outcome, which is very um, fourth wally, very like I'm aware that this is a story, like this is the part of the story where this happens type stuff. Uh, there's also the broad question of placement. Um, so right after Bakemonogatari, like Bakemonogatari, well, not Bakemonogatari, like Hitagi Crab. Hitagi Crab happened like last night um, and... Like, this is the next day. I think they're walking home from school is the implication. They're talking about, hey, I'm like, I've got weight again. It feels feels good. I'm not light as a feather, says Senju Gahara. And the vibes here are really interesting because it's a point in the story where these two characters, like, they don't like each other yet, like, at all, basically. Um, I, I guess Aragi's broadly interested because she's a woman with a pulse. Um, but, like... Senjo is just like broadly thankful of Araraki. Like, I'm fond of him. He's all right. But it's more the events of Mayui Snail that establishes that thing. So it's like a tentative, like, it's tense. <laughs> it's tense between the two. Um, and again, we're contrasting that with the end of the episode, which is towards the end of the month. A lot more things have happened. I believe they're boyfriend and girlfriend by that point. And yeah, they're, they're talking a lot more naturally. Which is interesting to see, like, the change in conversation over a month. Other broad stuff is that, hey, the soundtrack is very similar to, like, Hitagi Crab as well. Like, specific songs. As well as, like, editing style. Lots of street signs everywhere. Lots of construction. Um, again, that... Again. Hitagi Crab vibes all over the place. The other thing is this would immediately precede Mayui Snail. Which is kind of about forgetting things. Broadly, kind of, um, where Aragi has the opportunity to just walk away from that Mayu si snail situation and it would be fine, but he doesn't. Is is this anything? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to find that kind of connection. Because again, the most obvious thing is connecting this straight to Awari. Um, but again, why would Senju Gahara say that? What are they forgetting at that point in the story? I don't know. I don't know, I'd need to do some more timeline digging as to what Senju Gahara is specifically talking about there. Or maybe, again, it's outside of the show. It's more of a line for the audience than Araragi himself. Either way, I guess I should talk about the... So we're away from the stone. The stone was the... Stone's old news. We're under flowers. Um, and again, very similar structurally, the whole episode. Uh, taking place on a walk back from school the day after the events of a target crab, Senju Gahara is relieved after her condition has gone away and wants to find some way to repay Oshino, because it's a whole bunch of yen she needs to pay. I forget where this ended up. I forget if he for forwent this 
debt or it was actually paid off or, or what happened there. I, I honestly just forget. Either way, Araragi suggests stories of aberrations to pay for it, um, kind of similar to Hanakawa in the previous episode as well. Senjukahara can't think of any until she sees some flowers by a roadside. She almost walks like straight out into traffic on a dangerous road, apparently, and almost gets run over. Again, squinting, you could also relate this to a broad traffic light idea, danger, no danger, something. Again, <laughs> is this anything? Um, anyway, that that's when she remembers an anecdote about some flowers on the top of buildings at school. I need to reread the part of the episode why it says that she's up on these roofs, but I digress. Either way, she implies that they could be from some unknown suicide at school or some kind of mystery or some kind of aberration involved, blah, 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 blah. He brings it to Oshino. Oshino says he has no use for it, that it's without value, and there's some broad stuff regarding if flowers at dangerous places are safe or even more dangerous. Like, do they serve as a warning, or are they too beautiful enough that you just walk and look up to them anyway, and it kind of brings people more people to those dangerous situations. That's when we can imply that the flowers are probably placed on like these roofs by somebody who probably built the fence or some person of staff or something, uh, as a warning sign to not go up there, that it's dangerous, that, like, suicide put aside, like, it's dangerous to play up there because you could fall and die. That's why this flower's there, right? Again, I'm relating this to real life where I drive on, you know, these Australian country roads and it's not uncommon to see flowers on the side of the road, like, a lot. Um, again, people are stupid. They drive dangerously, blah, 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 blah. And I thought in my head, does this does this impact me at all? Does this change my decision making process? Do I see that there and potentially drive slower, or do I get distracted by said flowers when I'm driving on the roads? And honestly, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I haven't crashed yet, I haven't died yet, um, but I would imagine that those, yeah, I, more more than anything, I just kind of look at it, go, huh, and then just keep driving. So I guess it's more dangerous than safe. It doesn't make me slow down, put it that way. There's some other stuff about, like, Sendra being dumb for thinking that you would put flowers for a memorial on a roof instead of, like, where they fell. Um, which is true. But also, there's some, like, stuff about sweeping the situation under the rug. I forgot a whole element here of Aragi climbing up the outside of the school to get up to the roof because the roofs are locked, um, to have a little bit of a look around. And then that being the reason for why... <laughs> the school then goes under some renovations. So I guess you could say, like, broadly carrying off the themes of, of this, Araragi's, like, weird actions resulting in reactions. <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? Like, like Araragi doing thing results in large implication that he didn't foresee. His actions kind of butterfly effect out to huge ramifications. Again, is this anything? I don't I don't know. Uh, this one was main, way more straightforward for mine. I think I understood episode one a lot more. This one is like tangentially related to stuff. There's some stuff about forgetting. Um, I can't really relate it to its point in the story where this, I think, was pretty clearly about Neko Kuro. I don't think that this one here... I can't see the connection to either Mayui Snail or even Hitagi Crab, really. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Road. Road crash. Um, uh, b b b Mayui died of a car crash. Or she got ran over. Okay, that that is something. That is something. And then flowers for that? I don't know. I don't know. That That is something, though. Oh, yeah, either way, I'm getting this episode up. I'm sure you guys will, will tell me. So, again, this episode is just a great chance to watch good openings again like this opening slaps the song's fantastic it's very nostalgic big old Sandra Gahara walking out of places and all the stationery all the school equipment yeah takes me back to the good old days and Koyomi flower is what we're calling a little arc we have this same thing again where it's chapter one says mouse which is like Aprilis so it's just kind of indicating the month again calendar thoughts and May, May 9th, that's where we get our date, again, the day after Hitagi Crab. We immediately start with this, like, Hitagi crab ass song with, like, the really spare piano. Like, it's very nostalgic. The first part of the episode is essentially just setting up where we are in the story. She had recently been relieved of the circumstances, the painful circumstances that had 
befallen her. Um, but she brought the pain back into herself regardless. Again, that's the that's the conclusion from Hitagi Crab, that that trauma and that kind of thing is you don't want to remove it from your life, right? Completely. You want to learn and grow from it. Uh, and once you're strong enough to do so, you can. Again, with the whole weight being a metaphor thing for trauma. I did notice like a moi being used in a lot of dialogue here as well, which again relates it to Hitaki Crab. Again, she's still very intense. She's not like a lovu lovu Senjugahara we've seen as of late. And we immediately get onto the plot like, Oshino charged me a fee for dealing with my condition. However, am I going to pay it? Even the walking around here, the street signs, just like, that, that's some some broad Mayui snail stuff, right? I think. It's more its more just broad Bakemonogatari iconography more than anything else. So again, Senjukahara is already in a ton of debt, so or her family. Um, so making this payment is going to be difficult. Again, I don't remember what the conclusion there was. Um, Araragi suggesting ghost stories as a method of payment. Again, very similar to the previous entry. Koyomi Monogatari episode one. Senjukahara immediately says, hey, I don't really have anything. The strangest thing was just solved yesterday, so... Like, I can't really re repay him with that, really. She immediately says, oh, what's this? Walks onto road. Looks like she's going to walk out into traffic, like, absent-mindedly. There's some focus on the eyes there, which is cool. And we, like, spin Senjukahara around and do, like, a cool dance. But again, this is way too early in their relationship for her to, you know, think anything of this. She just think it's, it's you know, kind of awkward. So she was going to jump out into traffic jump out into traffic. There's no cars, but like to have a closer look at these flowers, which again is your pretty prototypical, like there was a car accident here. We're going to put some flowers around a, a pole um, in the city. This is an interesting thing we use like this, this Araragi sign thing as like, like somebody could run out onto this road, probably alluding to the person that probably got hit. We see it later in a piece of symbolism, a piece of imagery, but yeah, the traffic cones, Street signs, industrial stuff, Baki Monogatari all over the place. And again, this other like fourth wally look back, nostalgic look at different parts in the story and using that similar imagery. Araragi says, hey, you got to watch out. If you cross the road to look at those flowers and they got ran over, your soul would never find peace. This lets Senjugahara remember something. A terrible tale. This is an order from the princess. Um, there was some broad fan Senjogahara stuff from the comments as well, so sure. Yeah, like, like, and this is probably referential as well, some traditional Japanese thing, princess, fan, something, went over my head. So, <laughs> Senjogahara tells him the story, and then we, the next scene we see is him, like, climbing up a building. I'm like, what the hell happened? Yeah, this is the next day, um, a briding by the princess's orders. I paid a visit to the roof, and there was some flowers up on the roof. Now, ain't that just strange? It was a fresh bouquet of flowers, so somebody had placed it up here recently. Probably a member of staff, I think, is the implication in the end. How did Senjugahara get up to the roof? I may not be Miss Hanakawa, but I'm still an honor student. I mean, to see it in the first place, I mean, how did Senju get up to the roof? It's easy enough for me to come up with a pretext to borrow the key from a teacher, because you're trustworthy, because you're, like, good at school. Gotcha. What brought you up there in the first place? I was thinking about my personal security after entering Naoetsu High School. She was a woman who took greater precautions compared to others. She herself had investigated the school for an entirely different reason to Hanakawa. She explained how she thoroughly established where was safe and where danger lurked. So she... She's like, okay, I've got this weird thing going on while I wait. I don't want anybody to know about it. I've got to scope out like dangerous spots in the school. So she came up with an excuse and found a way to uh, scope out this particular location. Uh, and that's when she saw the flowers. Gotcha. Again, like very obvious Senjukahara stuff. If there's one thing about Senjukahara, it's stationary and it's street signs. And now we're like literally combining the two. Interesting. And the signs are relevant here because it's all about warning signs for dangerous locations and if flowers will suffice in that location as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange tale even if there are no ghosts or spiritual element to it. And again, similar to the previous episode, like through the 18th year history, there hadn't been any ghost stories or anything, any nothing really. And But here's this. What gives? Why are there flowers here when there's been no incidents? There was a little part here where it's like, putting that aside, how the hell am I going to get back inside as well? Which I thought was, was cute too. 
So we tell this story to Oshino, again, much like the previous episode. Oshino rejects it, basically. It's not going to meet my standards. It's not going to pay off any of the debt. Again, continuing on from last episode as well, we see little Shinobu here. She's got that helmet on now. Head pat protection is the implication, I believe. So fundamentally, that layout leads to more accidents happening. It's a dangerous piece of the road. There's a weird turn. Um, civilians walk across it all the time. Something like that. Like, it's, it's accident prone. Uh, as well as the roof, the roof of the school, similar way. It's accident prone. You going up there is inherently more dangerous than being on the ground. But in her case, the flower offering stole her attention, and that's specifically why it was dangerous in this case. The problem at hand is answering why flowers have been placed on every single rooftop. So why would they be placed on every single rooftop if... Um, it had only occurred on one if there was an actual incident backing it up. I like this uh this like chalk on the ground aesthetic too. So we go like chalk on the ground here into like playful chalk, like hopscotch chalk on the ground. Um if it's like a yeah, you know what I mean. They're, they're, they're having fun. Like, more street signs, like, mountain in the background denoting height. Flowers, specifically on this, like, floor plan of the school, basically. Attack on Titan reference for good measure. Um, but yeah, they're basically explaining, like, schools have, like, roofs, but they normally have fences that are really tall. They're normally pieces of infrastructure in place to stop dangerous places from being that way. Whether near the road or in school, there's dangerous places. Put simply... They're like opposite places of power. And yeah, like this is this is weird. So they're places that attract negative spiritual energy, but they're also just like dangerous places. So it's more like chicken egg stuff from the previous episode as well. And the explanation that Meme has here is that, no, there is no spiritual stuff here, right? It has to do with the location and other aspects about terrain or or anything, right? It's not, it's not spiritual. Senjukahara almost walked onto the road, not because of an oddity or a spirit, but because of the angle at which the flowers were placed. It's completely logical and not in the world of oddities, which is why uh, Meme thinks, hey, I'm going to go reposition those flowers after this. If a bouquet placed in an offering can invite further disaster, don't you think that it could bring about the opposite as well? And yeah, this is the central conceit of putting the flowers there as a warning is the main intention behind putting them on the roofs, right? People have died here, do not be here. And that's something that, I don't know if it was a member of staff or construction or what, put on each of these roofs. So Araragi like, chose to like basically not think about this again until the end of the month, the end of May, where uh, there's a better relationship established between Senjugahara and Araragi. So, so they're literally walking around. They see that their school is like a ton of construction going on. And that's when Araragi remembers. Uh, to keep it short, those bouquets formed a part of the school's management of the rooftops. Yeah, so in the same way that the keys are used to lock the roofs or building fences, it's a prevention method for people uh, playing on the roofs or even committing suicide off roofs, right? Like, it's a dangerous place. You should not be here. It was more of like a charm, a jinx, something for peace of mind. Like, put, put it this way. I see the, the point of view of the staff members as, hey... Okay, we, we've locked these roofs, we've put up these fences, everything that I can do within my power to prevent people from falling off these roofs, I'm going to do, so why not put these flowers here, is, the, is their view on it, I think, which, which works in a weird, twisted way. Oh my god, I'm so stupid, I just realized another element of this whole thing is that uh, those flowers being there and the staff members putting those flowers there made Senjukahara see those flowers and then inadvertently tell Araragi to go and look at the flowers as well, thus putting him into a dangerous situation where he needed to climb the side of the building. Okay, that is a whole other layer to this that I just missed, and I want to make sure that I get that across that I at least understood it eventually. Let's put it that way. The flowers give the impression that somebody died there, which serves as an indirect warning to those that the area itself is dangerous. Accidents happen frequently, so be careful. Someone probably thought that the standard warning signs didn't quite cut it. So then the whole conceit of it is like this dual meaning between like something representing a warning sign, but something also being quite beautiful that attracts people to a certain location as well. It's more for peace of mind. It's not a actual measure that they've put in place. 
Uh, fences locking the door should be enough. And then we get like scary Araragi. There are students who are like you that lie their way onto roofs after all. And again, like this rapport between the two, it's obviously a lot stronger than it was. You're a sly as a serpent. Something about a sweet poison. I don't really see anything there. You could you could twist that to be Nadeko adjacent. So it's literally like the school's putting their faith in something that's a little bit jinxy, charmy, as well as the actual methods of keeping the students safe. How on earth did Oshino conclude that from all that you told him? And yeah, we justify this by <laughs> these two people, uh, Araragi and Senjugahara, being oblivious to an obvious fact from the start, that whether accident or suicide, if somebody fell to their death, wouldn't you place the offering on the ground relative to the roof? And that little reaction there by Senjugahara as well, she's obviously slightly embarrassed that she would even think this, that the both of them would think this. In a similar way to last episode, it's Oshino pointing out uh, relatively simple stuff, probably grinning the whole time. Um, like, this is a stupid question. Like, why are you asking me this? And, like, he has, like, like the, there's no, there's no stakes here. It's very low-key, you know? Like, Oshino doesn't, he doesn't care because it's irrelevant, <laughs> basically. And it's these two goobers trying to figure it out. But yeah, because of their actions, these measures won't be necessary in the future. Because the renovation of the rooftops of the school, um triggered his memory of this incident in the first place at the end of May. That's what triggered him to even start this conversation here with Senju Kahara for this scene. Um, so essentially, they, they found out that somebody scaled the side of the school and made their way up to the roof and needed to put in safety measures uh, to prevent that didn't happen again, resulting in this. So again, the broad theme of Araragi doing thing innocuously and it resulting in dire consequences like doing something without thinking, forgetting about it, and then something happening as a result. And he feels somewhat guilty about it, and then Senjugahara would be implicated as well for egging him on to go up there and check. And we suggest this as our secret. This is going to be our secret, me and you. Secret may not cut it. We're going to do instead what we've done up until now, up until this moment. Forget all about it. Forget all about it. Because that's what Araragi did leading up to this conversation as well. Gotcha. So that's the connection. It's not it's not further implications about Sendra Gahara, it's merely just this like like forgetting that we even had that conversation, which the both of them did. Um and yeah, again, the forgetting stuff implicates further into Awari Monogatari and a lot of Araragi's past and a ton of stuff, right? It's more of a meta reference than anything else. Him forgetting things is now a theme between this and the other episode as well. We're looking for those kind of connections. Uh, so we've got like reliance on Oshino, we've got forgetting things, we've got like weird things, esoteric stuff that Araragi does that results in things greater than he thought would have happened. They spin off and he forgets about them. Like that's the kind of vibe, right? Um, as well as like revisiting these different locations in the story and getting different stuff from them. Yeah, this is strange. This is a very weird way to tell a story, but I'm kind of digging it. I think for a lot of people, this is probably a polarizing arc. It's The content itself isn't really the point. You have to look at it in relevance to where it is in the timeline, but also where it is in the telling of the story itself as well. What came before it? What precedes it? What 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 happens after it in the worry? Like you got to think about all these different things, and then you will start to find the meaning. Because if you don't, then these stories are just really boring. Again, there's still the general editing style, music, blah blah blah. blah. How, how it invokes certain parts in the story is really good. But yeah, you just gotta you gotta squint. You gotta squint to find the meaning. And I think that's yeah. I, I'm I'm probably benefiting a lot from this part of the story as well. For like I've seen. A worry already, so I know what it's alluding to. Having seen seen this stuff and then not knowing what it's alluding to, is kind of insane. <laughs> That'd be an insane thing to to try to do. Um, but yeah, th th this is very interesting. I don't know how I'm going to go about doing like four of these in one video. I think three may be my upper limit because I still end up talking about them for quite a bit. Um, but yeah, th this was. Intriguing. <laughs> Intriguing. I wonder where we'll go next. I, I think Mayoi Snail is the opening, so probably not too far. Or maybe something with Hachikuji. 
I do not know. Maybe that's what the ED infers too, that each of these will be about a certain girl. So we've already done Hanakawa, Senjugahara. Maybe we just get to visit like one different situation with a different girl in the story at a different time. Maybe. You'd think maybe like a Mayui next, then maybe a Kambaru, then maybe a Nadeko, and go from there. One of the, each for one of the sisters, something. Is this anything? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. These were interesting. Either way, show stuff. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation. Comment below. I'm doing follow for follow on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter if you would like me to follow you back. And the Discord. Join Discord. Love Discord. Discord, Discord, Discord. And yeah, I'll catch you next time for more Hyorka themed little mystery episode 12 minute things about Araragi. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll probably try to do three next week. We'll see. Either way, I'll catch you guys later. Bye-bye.